a very good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Raymond Ong, uh, the Associate Head for Research and the uh, Graduate Research Program Manager for the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I am happy to see uh, you here, um, depending on the, which part of the world you are from, and to uh, listen to, to our little uh, sharing session on uh, why do a PhD or MEng in civil engineering or in environmental engineering here in NUS. Um, my presentation will be more towards um, sharing with you what our department is doing in terms of research and uh, why we are uh, a department which uh, will help you grow into emerging leaders, be it in the industry or in the academia, depending on where you uh, want to work in. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask during the Q&A session or to type later in the chat, uh, whereby we can actually answer the questions online. Now, the program for this session is as follow. First, I will give you a sharing session uh, on a, the overview of the research that is done in our department and how um, a research degree program in, uh, in civil engineering or in environmental engineering is is going to help you in uh, solving some of the bigger uh, problems, uh, research problems or scientific problems or social problems that you may be seeing uh, in the world today. Thereafter, uh, we will have a sharing session from a, a recent alumni, Dr. Ajay Shankar uh, from TU Delft uh, and uh, Mr. Go Jun Wei, uh, who is our PhD candidate uh, in environmental engineering. Uh, to share with you their experience uh, in their PhD studies here in NUS. And last but not the least, uh, we are going to have a Q&A session to basically uh, ask any questions and we'll try to answer. Okay, so without further ado, I shall go into the uh, presentation proper. So what is uh, NUS Civil and Environmental Engineering? In our department, we have a total of close to 40 uh, faculty members, 16 full professors, 13 associate professors, 8 assistant professors, 6 lecturers and senior lecturers, and 4 practice track professors and associate professors. Now, all of them are actively engaged in research and education, and even in local or international consultancy and advisory services. And you have a whole selection of these uh, faculty members who you can actually choose to work with for your PhD or your master's degree by research here in NUS. Now, why choose our department in civil engineering and environmental engineering? Our department is one of the top departments around the world. In fact, uh, we are ranked number three in civil and structural engineering and number 10 in natural sciences, in environmental sciences, in the 2022 QS World Ranking. And this is evidence that we are among the best leaders uh, leading civil engineering and environmental engineering department around the world. And in terms of our faculty members, many of our faculty members are actually winner of top international and top national research awards. And uh, you'll be learning from the best of the best here in our department. And many of my colleagues here in, in, in the department are actually serving as editor-in-chiefs and associate editors of top journals. And being a research uh, student, you want to publish in among the best journals around the world. So these are the network that can actually open the door for you. And many of our faculty members and colleagues that I have here in the department are serving as advisors to government agencies and NGOs. And this is precisely the network that you want so that you can keep an international and current outlook on an advisor that not only do good research, but can also influence. And this is an, a, a very important attribute when you're looking for a supervisor that can help you in your research career. And I can assure you that you'll be learning from 
the research leaders. And uh, our department actually has numerous faculty members who are leading national research and innovation programs within the built environmental sector and also within the environmental engineering sector. And here are some of the showcases whereby we have been actively showcasing our research and technology to uh, ministers, to visitors, and in the, in the media. Now, if you are wondering, as a research student in, in MEng or PhD, what kind of research you'll be working on here in our department? Now, not to worry, our department is working on numerous research that's emerging around the world. And our research is actually formed through clusters. This include climate change mitigation, whereby we are looking into how climate change affects seawater level rises and resilience mitigation strategy for a coastal city. Build Environment 4.0, whereby you'll be doing, we'll be working on productivity and digital technology, smart materials and AI technologies in the built environmental sector. Smart and livable cities, whereby we are looking into how smart technology actually enhance the ecological and social transition of the economy, how to create space of value and future smart mobility, urban mobility. Now on the environmental side, we may be looking into green energy, water and environmental science and technology, environmental biotechnology and so on. And we also have groups that are actually looking into ocean renewables and infrastructures. For example, how to actually have renewable offshore energy and how to design infrastructures to harness these renewable energies. And these are very emerging topics as we are actually moving towards less dependence on the traditional source of energy, which is petroleum. And last but not the least, because of the uncertainties that we face around the world, be it climate change or social demographics or aging, the society is facing a heavy resilience issue, that uncertain issue. And we need cities to be resilient. And one of our clusters that we are looking into includes resilient infrastructures, whereby we look into how to mitigate climate change, risk, and how to use digital twin to actually look into this aspect. Now, in the next few slides, I will briefly go through some of the interesting topics that we have been working on, um, and our research students are actually playing a huge role into working on, on these topics. Now, this gives you a little taste, a little taste on what you expect in our research degree, our research students are doing in their PhD work or their master's research work. For example, our group in coastal engineering and climate change are looking into developing coastal inland flood models to help predict due to climate change, how much the seawater is going to rise and how much flooding inland is going to cost. And this is extremely important, not only for Singapore, but also in many developing countries where there is very prone to flooding. And these are actually, and our, our, super, our potential supervisors such as Professor Vladan Babovic, Dr. He Xiaogang, Dr. Per Li, and Dr. Gary Lei, they are working in these areas, working closely with our grantors, be it the National Research Foundation or the PUB, our National Water Agency, into solving one of a critical problem around the world, which is flooding due to climate change. In addition, our colleagues, my colleagues in, in geotechnical engineering, such as Prof Go, Prof Qian, and uh, Prof Chu, they are looking into how to combat seawater level rises by creating land, creating land from the sea and making sure that this land remains usable, valuable land in the event of seawater level rises. And they include innovative technology to use powder, to use sand dike, to actually create land that is flood resilient. So these are some of the interesting issues that we have been working. Now, my colleague in structural engineering or structural materials, uh, Prof. Pang, Prof. Geng, and Dr. Tu, they are working into creating a concrete circular economy, such as making sure that carbon dioxide, CO2, is being captured in the concrete, thereby uh, uh, solving a problem of heavy uh, CO2 emission in the concrete industry. 
and how to reuse concrete from demolition waste or other form of waste and to give them a second life. Similarly, my research group in, uh, in asphalt technology, we are also working on the same thing on asphalt and we are looking into using waste plastics in actually uh, using on roads and how to mitigate uh, uh, the, the potential environmental impacts such as microplastic leaching in water or microplastic in, or, on, or carbon emission towards the air to, uh, in constructing such kind of infrastructures. So these are some of the emerging topics that we are look, looking into and how to create a plastic value chain and building industry out of it. And we are also working on construction automation and digital twin. Now this term digital twin is something that's very attractive and we can see that a lot of IT, AI, machine learning, they'll be very featured prominently in here and also in urban mobility technologies, whereby we are working on electric vehicle, autonomous vehicle, smart connected infrastructures, and also the digital twin system. Now, moving on to the environmental side, our research group in, in, in the department, such as the team led by Professor Karina Jin, is instrumental in doing COVID testing in wastewater. And in fact, many of her students are deployed in, in COVID to do COVID testing and to do emerging research and to do how to optimize COVID testing protocols in housing estates so that we can actually monitor uh, the health status and the resilience of our towns and cities in the event of a, a pandemic. So you can see that there's also a social impact. And uh, our colleagues in environmental engineering, such as Prof Wu, Prof Bala, Prof He, uh, Prof Yu and Prof Olivia, they are also working heavily in developing the national water circular economy infrastructure. And this includes water recycling treatment using the various advanced technologies, including treating hard to treat wastewater, especially from the industries. Now, some of them are actually working on air emission and quality of health, carbon emission, climate change, microplastics in air, and also microplastics in water. So you can see over here that many of our research students will be working into emerging research topics such as those that I've shown over here and some of them even more challenging and solving into global problems, national problems, societal problems so that we are bringing value to the industry, to the people and to the world. Now as such, our graduates have this attribute. In fact, our graduates have an attribute that is uh, highly valued by the industry. Most of our, our graduates either go to the academia or work in the industry. Now, for those who chose to work in the industry, there's no lack of companies that is working that wants to hire them. Many of our civil engineering or environmental engineering graduate, once they graduate, they work for the industry through the government sector, the NGOs and the private companies, and also the contractors. Here are the list of the companies that our graduates are employed in, ranging from ministries, government agencies, IT companies such as Shopee and Grab, uh, um, uh, uh, huge MNCs such as Pfizer, such as ExxonMobil, uh, consultant companies such as AECOM, um, uh, Sabana Jurong, um, and, and so on and so forth. So you can see that uh, if you choose to go to the industry, there's no lack of companies that are willing to hire our, our, our students. Now, in terms of academia, for those of you who are interested to say, think whether uh, you, you should be doing a PhD here in, in CEE, in civil engineering or in environmental engineering, not to worry. Our, our alumni are all over the world. And this is a list of some of where our alumni are currently teaching around the world. In Singapore, we have our, our alumni teaching. In fact, I'm an alumni here. I'm, I'm actually uh, teaching here in NUS. And, and I also have my students who are also teaching in SIT, Singapore Institute of Technology. Now we have a strong faculty alumni base in Australia, teaching in universities such as Monash, Melbourne, uh, Queensland, QUT, New South Wales. We have a presence there. And in Malaysia, in Japan, in most of the top China universities, we have our alumni who are actually working there now. In the US, for example, in Northwestern, 
we have one professor who is actually full professor who is actually working there now at Washington State University, University of Minnesota, and in Hong Kong, and in other parts, and in Europe, basically. So this is evidence that our graduates are in demand, not just only in Singapore, in the industry, but also internationally in the academia world. Now, if this still could not convince you, now the last slide that I want to show today is why do you want to do a graduate research here in NUS CEE? Now, number one, you'll be learning from top professors, learning with top professors in the emerging topics in civil engineering and environmental engineering. Now, I always advise my students to think about a few factors when they want to choose a supervisor for their PhD or master's degree I research. Now, it typically depends on number one, the reputation of a professor that you're going to look at. Number two, the standing of the university that you're going to study. And number three, the emerging work that you're going to work on. And if you look at what I've presented just now, we are, I'm basically ticking the check boxes. Our professors are internationally renowned. Our ranking is high. Inter and, and they are, our students and our, our professors are also winning international research awards. And we are passionate to see that you grow if you choose to study with us. In short, our track record says it all. And um, I hope that you will actually consider us as an option. And if you have any questions related to um, a PhD and a research degree here in our department, um, I'll be happy to answer questions later on. And uh, if not, you can always email us and visit our website at cte.nus.edu.sg slash CEE. Okay, so with that, I will end my introductory uh, sharing session. And then uh, the next part is I will invite uh, our alumni and our students to share what they have done or what they have been here in, in Singapore. First, I will get uh, Dr. Dr. RJ uh, from TU Delft. He's a lecturer in civil engineering, and he was my former PhD student. And uh, he'll be giving us uh, what he thinks about uh, doing a PhD here in NUS. Okay, uh, RJ, uh, I will stop sharing screen for you to share. First and foremost, I would like to thank the College of Design and Engineering for their kind invitation. And uh, I would like to thank my PhD advisor and my and the moderator of the session, Professor Raymond, for his support and uh, invitation as well. So the topic of my presentation is uh, NUS CEE paving the road to the future. I did my undergraduate in India and my PhD at uh, NUS Singapore. During my PhD, I got like uh, very good opportunities at different places. One good opportunity is the internship at uh, Changi Airports International. And uh, after my PhD, I was working as a postdoc for one year at uh, NUS Environmental Research Institute. And uh, very recently, I uh, shifted to TU Delft as a lecturer. A uh, major motivation of my PhD is to reduce the road accidents. Do you know for uh, every 24 seconds, someone dies on the road? So what we were trying to do as a road engineer or a pavement engineer is to reduce these accidents. And one solution is the porous roads, which uh, we here at Netherlands has been using it for the past uh, 20 years. So my PhD is in fact related to the drainage capacity and the frictional stability of the pervious pavements. And this work was awarded a best paper award in Japan last year. And the novelty of our work is that we were the first one to model the non-Darcy permeability when the whole world was modeling the Darcy permeability for uh, pavement structures. And we were able to identify and uh, quantify the error in numerous research publications, not just limited to pavement engineering or civil engineering, but also in uh, porous media journals. Uh, our work was uh, presented in multiple conferences around the globe from US, Switzerland, South Africa, and many countries in uh, Asia. 
So currently, my teaching interest spans like a very wide bit, varying from uh, transportation engineering, finite element analysis, environmental assessment, and uh, research ethics. This is my first picture, first mini lecture I delivered at uh, TU Delft. Now, currently, I'm embarking on a newer journey, like uh, from research to the teaching. Like currently, we are having so many challenges in teaching as well. So how to improve the teaching for the next generation students, for the digital generation, and how to create an inclusive environment for the diverse students coming from different backgrounds, different skill sets, different mindsets. And recently, Netherlands conducted a wonderful study on the relation between teaching quality and the research quality. And the results are surprising as well. Well, NUS, is, NUS will help you with uh, improving not just the uh, research quality, but it will also help you with improving your teaching quality through the TA programs. Uh, this is my current team at TU Delft. They have been supportive and uh, kind in all my endeavors. They even invited me to a PhD defense ceremony as a paranum recently. Well, the topic is like uh, transform your career. You have like uh, 40 to 45 years of life, which you have to use it productively and uh, be happy as well. So since you are all here, you would have already decided to do PhD at uh, PhD or MBANG at uh, NUS. You, you obviously know the ranking is very good. NUS is ranked at number 11 and in all over the globe and number three in civil and environmental engineering. This is, the, this is a clear validation for why you should choose NUS among all the other universities. What I'm going to share you is like, uh, the, these contents you will not find it online. And uh, number one factor why you should choose NUS is like, uh, they have huge amount of funding. And uh, this will, post professors and uh, postdocs are working very hard to secure funding for your research and your life at Singapore. And the uh, second important factor, which I personally see as well as like, uh, it is the, it will, it will make you the shorter time period for your PhD. If you are exceptionally good in your bachelor's, you can skip like two years of your time for the master's and you can directly join for your PhD. And even at NUS, we are, we are strongly, they are strongly encouraging you to submit your thesis in four years. By this way, again, you can save like two years of time. In all the other universities abroad, they have, they have to spend like six to seven years of their time in submitting the thesis. But this does not, does not mean the quality is compromised. Again, they will ensure the high, higher quality as well. I, I guess like the remaining four points you will be able to, uh, this is common uh, and uh, Professor Raymond had already mentioned about this. Well, there are many challenges in academia as well. The job market in academia is uh, very competitive. So NUS has like very good strategies or solutions to tackle these challenges. Before going to the challenges, let's look at solutions. I will explain about the statistics. If you look at this figure, in 120 years, the number of publications per year has increased so much. Currently, it is like 1 million publications per year. How do you find, how do you make your publications or your work so unique? And NUS supports the idea of waves of innovation. It is more like uh, in every field, some new topics will emerge, stabilize, and eventually it will die. So what we are trying to do is always sticking to the waves of innovation. By this way, you will be easily employable and uh, you will be makes, you're able to make some good impact on the planet. Second one, second solution is the high quality. Here at uh, NUS, they will, they will always encourage you to stick to the high quality or the breakthrough research, not on the incremental research. Even I found it very hard to uh, understand this kind of uh, research at the beginning. And uh, I, I, at this point of time, I, I totally appreciate uh, this breakthrough research and the impact it will have on our career as well. But the, we need to have a huge patience to carry, pursue this, uh, this kind of re, uh, research. And one common mistake most people would do is the comparison. 
so we should not compare it with our compare our progress i mean like phd progress with our friends or our seniors or uh, different people from different universities so we have to follow the uh, unwritten rules we have at uh, nus for the high quality of the work third one is the impact on practice here if you look at this graph x axis is the impact on practice and y axis is the impact on science students will always opt for high fancy uh, work in science if the work is not fancy enough they will not uh, do that work and professors will always go for something to be more applicable so we we always need to bridge these two extremes and uh, this is the numbers over here represent some of my contributions or some of thesis chapters initially we started with high impact in science then eventually we reduced the complexity and made it into practice and we are still trying to make it, make it into practice and uh, the f over here represents some of the failures in my phd and now i consider f for the funding and uh, yeah so the fourth uh, strategy which nus teaches is the awards instead of rather than going forward with the number of publications or the number of citations these are all some of the achievements by my seniors in the past 30 years and they were able to make a very good track record and uh, they were able to set up a good role models for us so the common line which you will hear at nus is like before you write think think carefully whether you need it or not and the fifth fifth solution which uh, nus teaches us is how to write the grants and they will help you with the step by step process they will help you with the writing proposals and uh, how to convert our science into wealth and to get into funding again there is a misconception that since we are finishing our phd in 3 uh, years or 4 years again the quality is not compromised we always need to put into more effort to achieve the better results in lesser amount of time and as i said earlier with the job market in academia nus is proposing a newer program called grip which is the graduate research innovation program so through this program you will be able to uh, work on your startups or the companies creating companies when you are doing your phd nus will provide a seed fund of like uh, 100000 singapore dollars and uh, there are many statistics which says like uh, phd students are just interested in joining a startup rather than founding a new one well i believe that this needs to be disproved and i am uh, highly encouraging this one with my students and with my juniors as well i hope to see this one in the near future and whatever knowledge i just shared with you whatever solutions which nus i i just shared with you is just the tip of the iceberg and there are so many strategies which will help help you to shape your career and uh, transform you into a successful person so i can clearly say that nus is not preparing you just for the graduation day but for the life or the career for next 40 years if you would like to know more about my work you can always find it in my youtube channel i am trying to upload my teaching research and uh, service over here and i just i gave a very similar invited talk last year on the advice for phd aspirants you can find that well i would like to finish my presentation by sharing a short uh, story from pirates of the caribbean do you think the captain jack sparrow plans everything out or he just makes it up as he goes along the waves answer is both he he plans something and uh, wind takes care of something thank you thanks again for this invitation yeah thank you uh, aj and uh yeah we will have another 10 more minutes and these will be uh taken by uh, our current phd student uh, mr go jin wei he is a phd candidate in the area of environmental engineering so without further ado i'll invite uh, jin wei to share his uh thoughts about being a phd student here in the us okay um dear hi everyone can you see my screen yes okay good okay so uh Good afternoon to uh, prospective students. Uh, so I think Prof Ong and uh, Dr. Ajay uh, gave a good glimpse into and a good over, overview of 
uh, what your PhD entails, uh, especially in the um, acad academic career. So today I'll be sharing uh, my humble journey as an environmental engineering PhD student. So my title goes uh, by uh, the fate of transformation of a research student and embracing opportunities and write the type. So I think there seems to be a, some sort of like a uh, common thread with what Dr. Ajay mentioned about um, Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, so next slide. So uh, just a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Jude Wei, as mentioned, um, fourth year PhD student under the supervision of Prof Hu. Um, currently, I'm actually working along with uh, Simtech ASTA. Uh, I've been working on uh, particularly pharmaceutical wastewater. So just now, um, Dr. Ajay has mentioned um, we work with collaborators outside and you know it, 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 it serves as a, a, a good opportunity for you to learn um, very industrial relevant kind of research and at the same time uh, um, emerging work you know uh, as mentioned by uh, Prof Ong. So yeah so I'm working on um, organic abatement technologies. Um, I have been looking into metal organic frameworks um, in in expect of photo uh, photo cat um, catalyst. Uh, my main line of work or uh, basically the overarching um, idea is actually advanced oxidation technologies, so advanced oxidation processes. Um, so other than those, uh, I've dipped my toes into data analysis and modeling, uh, like Python, R programming, and machine learning, etc. So other um, interesting facts about me is, uh, you know, my hobbies and some of the external roles that uh, I'm part of. So why do I actually choose this title? Uh, so in the field of environmental engineering, one key aspect uh, uh, or one key thing about our field is to break down organic pollutants. Uh, so essentially to clean water and the aqueous medium uh, by different oxidants. So one of the oxidants that we have is um, hydroxyl radical. So they are generally non-selective in nature. Um, so in the organic pollutant uh, we look at here, this is uh, a very recalcitrant um, micropollutant, uh, pharmaceutical micropollutant uh, called carbamazepine. So uh, through its degradation, um, it takes on many forms. And um, through its, um, and many times, um, the physical and chemical properties of this of its byproducts are different from the parent compound. So why did I highlight this is because this holds parallels to your PhD and MS journey that you're about to embark on. Uh, there'll be milestones and key events along the way that will change you as an individual. So what I'm doing here is actually to give you a glimpse uh, into uh, a PhD life. Uh, and I think why I'm here to give the talk is because um, it's very fresh for me. Um, and last but not least, the word fate. Uh, why I used, uh, why is there this word fate and how, how is it relevant? Is this, where can you potentially land yourself in terms of career progression, year ring, and upon your graduation uh, as an NUSCD graduate? So as a, a millennial postgrad student, uh, something that we ingest on a day-to-day -day basis are memes. Uh, so one telltale sign that you know you are for sure a postgraduate student is suddenly all these PhD memes are extremely relevant. Uh, so this meme actually captures really well about your journey of a PhD student. But my intention is not to scare you. Uh, it's, to, it's to let you know that you have to go through some form of academic uh, adversities to grow. And the journey will bring forth very meaningful experiences along the way as well. So just two months, also this is my journey, uh, a quick glimpse. So just two months into my PhD, I was actually selected to attend this conference and exhibition in New Orleans, USA called WebTech. Uh, I was there actually for a WebTech student design competition. We were fortunate enough to clinch fourth. And uh, um, I went beyond that, um, decided to volunteer in, in a web community service. Uh, we retrofitted a planter box, uh, basically um, similar to our ABC kind of feature uh, here in Singapore to a local community, uh, to at a local community center uh, to treat their stormwater capture from roof. Uh, so through this, there was a lot of strong camaraderie forged with some of the U.S. students from Florida, Florida International University or John Hawking University. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, 
joining us um, here in NUSC as a PhD or MN students gives you such opportunities, uh, overseas opportunities, conferences, um, uh, so and so forth. So with regards to teaching and mentoring, uh, I also had the opportunity to put my mentoring skills to test. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be able to get uh, a very group, a group of very talented um, students from Hua Chong. Um, and they clinched distinction for their project and a silver award for the Singapore Science and Engineering Fair. Uh, and to that, I was also humbled to have received uh, the Science uh, Mentorship Program Outstanding uh, Mentor Award. So I think for every, um, I, I think I can speak for all uh, prospective postgrad students, uh, even uh, academia uh, faculty members, that there's a common thread of uh, us being, you know, innately curious and wanting to be challenged. So the natural, nat uh, the naturally inquisitive and uh, intrinsically motivated me decided to take on this project with Institute of Water Policy. Um, so I do have a very strong passion for water and it all kick-started uh, during my internship uh, with PUB uh, when I was an undergraduate and that propelled me to continue to pursue my postgrad. So, because I have a very strong uh, interest on uh, knowing the water industry and the water climate here in Singapore, so uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of this uh, agent-based model approach to explore uh, the future of water security. So, we use um, agent-based model called NetLogo, essentially to map up uh, weakness and strengths of Singapore water system through a deployment of repeated simulation. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this this was uh actually, this was extremely eye opening for me. I had the opportunity to work with um uh, associate professor from other countries and even uh, students from uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So um, my advice is that during your journey, uh, let's say you are going through a PhD um journey, right? Um, to have good side on to have side ongoing projects uh, to complement your main research. Because from time to time, uh, your main research will actually met up with a hurdle. And uh, as human beings, we always need to have this uh, drive to, you know, we are constantly improving or moving forward. So, um, yeah, so it's good to have ongoing project that is not too taxing, that is taking away your attention from your main research, but, you know, something that still let you continue, uh, constantly moving forward. So for this agent-based modeling, uh, initially I was not well versed, but as mentioned, I was leveraging on my exposure earlier on, and I was able to pick up very quickly uh, and contribute uh, quite extensively to this project. So last but not least, um, uh, it was SIWW, which is Singapore International Water Week. Uh, so this was an event for uh, water engineers like myself. Uh, it was a part of the culmination of my four years of PhD work. I had, the op I had the opportunity to take part in the post presentation to discuss about my research work and even exchange ideas and experiences with industrial professionals, uh, academias, and even government officials. Uh, yeah, so aside from the technical interaction, I was also keen to hear the voices of uh, Singapore's youth leaders on sustainability, zero, zero waste, and green citizenry issues. So I signed up myself with you know youth environmental leaders uh, on the second day of conference to have a fireside fire side chat with you know green youth champions and uh, the minister herself. Um, I was also fortunate enough uh, to be accepted and enrolled into a group called Youth Water Professionals, uh, where I get to co-chair a technical session uh, with uh, one of my very own prof, prof uh, her and also present a summary of technical session uh, we attended during the closing plenary. Uh, so during the technical session, you it's, it's, a, it's a good validation of um, your work uh, or your understanding of research or what is at the forefront because uh, you start to realize that you and uh, the, the guests or the speakers from all over the country, uh, I mean, all, all across the globe speaking the same language and uh, one of them actually, you know, uh, gave me the affirmation that, oh, uh, uh, because I, I posed a question during the technical session, he said, oh, this is something that, you know, uh, someone that is in research work will, will pose that kind of question. So, yeah, so in, in basically, it, 
for me, SLW was an eye-opening experience for me. So uh, putting myself out there, embracing the opportunities, as I mentioned for the title of my talk, is that I have been rewarded handsomely in terms of connection and experience. So um, due to the pandemic, uh, my opportunity to attend overseas conference has been severely diminished. But um, as a postgraduate student, you have to make uh, the best out of your own situation. And so my experiences has not been dampened because um, I'm constantly uh, maximizing my time as a postgrad student. So uh, these are other things that I actually took part in. So you can actually even do an exchange program with uh, NTU if you want uh, for some modules, uh, just to expand um, your understanding of the field uh, and whatnot. Uh, so if you were to embark on you know, a postgrad graduate program with us, uh, some of the survival tips that I uh, can share with you is that, you know, keep an active lifestyle. So uh, starting with my postgrad, um, I decided to enroll, uh, I decided to pick up dragon boating, you know. Um, so having an active lifestyle is extremely important uh, for both mentally and physically. So, and always remember there's a life beyond academia as well. So, because sometimes when you are so invested in your research that, you know, uh, you tend to push everything aside. So, but uh, never do that, you know, always uh, make time for your friends and your loved one and continue your life plans uh, as you intended. Uh, last um, third point is never work in silo. So always talk to your peers, your colleagues, your supervisor. Uh, this, they stay no gain in hampering your progress. So you'll be surprised that most of the people uh, in lab are willing to go and even go the extra mile to help you. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'm glad to share uh, something similar with uh, Dr. Ajay, which is, you know, speaking uh, on uh, the digital uh, platforms. Uh, so yeah, I'll continue to be very passionate about my field and spread the knowledge. So during the pan pandemic, I was invited by another group of my postdoc friends uh, to do a podcast on my field where we talk about activated sludge processors, wastewater treatment processors, and something mentioned by Prof. Raymond, which is wastewater surveillance. And that was a hot topic, uh, especially with COVID-19. So keep the fire burning. Yeah. And last but not least, um, addressing job opportunities. So of course, when you continue postgrad, uh, you are likely to give, uh, you are likely to hope to give academia a shot. But that does not necessarily entail to narrating your career path. Uh, in fact, it actually broadened. So um, just a very personal anecdote uh, on my end is that um, I am actually ending my candidature in a few months' time, uh, but I was extremely flattered uh, by the offers presented by um, the government agency, MNCs and private companies uh, just a few months back. So um, as a postgrad student, I think what is key to, to bridge that gap is that you need to crystallize uh, what attributes of your postgrad journey that is appealing uh, to the job on hand. Uh, so, um, for instance, uh, my short stay with um, uh, uh, Institute of Water Policy, where there's a bit of programming involved, uh, I was actually offered by another company uh, based on this very minuscule part of my resume. So, um, so never self-eliminate, uh, never self-limit your capability. So, for myself, um, I'm actually heading out to uh, industry heading wastewater for for one of the oil and gas MNC. So it's a path that, you know, I've never foreseen myself to be in. So I think that sums up my talk for the final chapter of FIT. So thank you again for listening. Uh, I shall end my talk. Yeah. Thank you, Jingwei, uh, for your sharing. Uh, I hope that uh, with this sharing session, uh, you can see that uh, the opportunities that our department can offer in a graduate research degree, be MN or PhD, civil engineering and environmental engineering. And from the sharing session from our recent alumni and our current PhD candidate and going to be alumni soon, <laughs> uh, and uh, that you can see uh, that we actually open windows for our students and open doors too, okay? Windows and doors. <laughs> and, and, and make sure that our students can excel, uh, be it in wherever path that they choose to work in. And uh, we hope that you seriously give us a thought. And if you want to know more about our, our graduate research program, please feel free to email me or my administrative uh, staff uh, at, uh, in our CDE website and the CDE CEE website. 
for more information. Okay, and with this, I thank you so much for your uh, presence here in this uh, webinar. And uh, I'll, I hope to see you again in sometime soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.